Thanks for tuning in to the Mutual Fund Show. My name is Neeraj China. Over the next 25 minutes, we will talk about what to do if you are an investor wanting to invest into mutual funds, wanting to create a mutual fund portfolio. 2017 was a year of unprecedented gains for anybody who came into the came into the equity markets over the last two or three years. 2018 is turning out to be slightly different, and which is why it becomes important to take stock of your mutual fund investments and try and figure out how to invest or how to create an ideal mutual fund scenario or mutual fund portfolio. Now, let me just tell you why is this important. If you just look at the last 10 years CAG, uh, CAGR number, growth numbers, and boy, have you been through some ups and downs for the equity markets in the last 10 years. But if you had a pure play equity portfolio, you would have done much better than a fixed deposit or, a, or, or some investments into gold as well. But not all of us invest for 10 years. Some of us have different uh, time zones. Some of us may want to invest for the next six months, maybe for the next 12 months. Would mutual funds be the ideal uh, avenue out there? Well, consult your financial advisor. But what I'm trying to tell you is that if you have a long-term view in BI9, then there is no doubt that you can go in for equity po fund portfolios. And we'll ask our guest about that as well. But if your view is not 10 years, what should you be doing? Let's pose that question to Mr. Sunil Subramaniam. He's the CEO of Sundaran Mutual Fund. Joins us right now on the show. Good evening, Mr. Subramaniam. Thank you so much for taking the time out and joining us Thanks on the show. Thanks for having me. Yeah. No, pleasure having you. Um, so what should the approach of an average uh, investor be in a scenario like this? 2017 was completely different, and maybe your advice would still be the same. But ra now investors are beginning to realize that Volatility is the name of the game. It will not be always an upgoing portfolio. My first thing for you, what you called as the average investor is to, when they say KYC, right, know your customer, I would say is know yourself, hmm. right? Why I'm saying this is the risk tolerance of an investor, right? It's given, it's genetic. It's a function of his past experiences of stock market and various uh, uh, you know, gambles that he's taken. And so I think that should be the predominant thing. Because as you showed, if somebody stays for 10 years, right, the chances of 13%, uh, which is double the return of FDs or gold. But not the other, there's another slide which if you can show it'll be nice, is the proportion of time you lose money in the equity markets, right? Now if you stayed for an average one year in the nifty, right, 30% of the time you expected a negative a return, 30 percent of the time. You stayed five years, it moves to 10 percent. If you got 10 years, it's zero percent. So the why do you show any the period. reward? Huh? Any period. At any period, it's a rolling return kind of a concept. So the point is that that's the volatility of the stock market. So you said six months to one year. Do you recommend mutual funds? I don't even recommend the equity markets. Forget mm -hmm. mutual funds for six months to one year because the fund manager can at best outperform the index by two three percentage points. So if you have a negative return, you can minimize the negative, but you can't really. So I would say once you're coming into equities as an asset class, mutual funds is, gives you the expertise and diversification. Is you should have a minimum three year outlook. Right. So with uh, anything less than three years, then you're clearly a high risk capacity and you're tolerating, then you might as well go and, you know, invest in direct equities. You know, that's that's as good as that. So to me, the average investor, right, the whole concept of average investor, I would say an average risk averse investor, average risk neutral investor and average this, then we can talk in terms of what you should do. Hmm. Okay, so, so we'll talk about that as well. But yeah. so you would, you would say that largely for hmm. somebody who is wanting to build an ideal mutual fund portfolio. Mm. Let's say the time horizon is not decided in his or her mind. Okay. He wants to invest for the long term or she yeah. wants to invest for the long term yeah. but doesn't quite know whether it's three years, five years or ten years. Yeah. As of now, uh. he or she or mm. I am starting off mm. with say a five year horizon. Yeah. Would you recommend a mix of equity funds, hybrid funds, gold funds, debt funds, so on and so forth? Or would you say that, you no, know, if you have a slightly long-term horizon, you don't need to really fine-tune your portfolio this way? No, I think at any point of time, there has got to be diversification across these asset classes. I would not recommend for any investor, even if they have a 20-year horizon, that you should put everything into one bucket. Why I'm saying this, um, investors' thought process at the time he invests, and through the process of staying invested are very, very different, sure. one. Second, when you're investing, you're investing for a future goal. Because they say that all investment is a postponement of consumption. Nobody wants to build a corpus and die with all the money around his head, right? So you're planning for a future expenditure. That could be your daughter's marriage, son's education, or your own retirement. So you have a certain goal, right? And you prepare a financial plan with creating money for that goal. But what you need to prepare is, can that goal happen earlier? 
you plan for your daughter to get married at 25 she wants to get married at 21 or she postpones so life is full of uncertainties so though a particular asset class gives you very good long term returns you should always have the alternative option that suddenly you need money if that market is at a low then then your whole purpose of having invested is your wasted time whereas these asset classes which you mentioned like uh, debt mutual funds fixed deposits gold have the ability that their downside protection is better than equity in terms of highly volatile times so having this in your portfolio the proportion can vary but i would say never go 100 zero never go 100 equity never go 100 fixed income because both ways you're going to be a loser okay since mr subramaniam mentioned a risk neutral or risk averse investor i'm going to try and get in jayesh khilani to really give you a sense of what the returns of an average risk neutral investor would have been now let me just before i get in jayesh really uh, give you a small sense of classification and request mr subramaniam to do that that what would be a risk averse investor what would be a risk neutral investor and what would be a risk taker investor and what the different proportions of uh, the mutual fund schemes in his or her portfolio should be. Mm -hmm. Mr. Swamini, would you want to spell that out to your mind? Yeah. What, would, what would qualify as a portfolio of a risk taker investor, a risk neutral investor, or a risk averse investor? Okay. So a risk taker investor is prepared to suffer losses of erosion of capital in the short term mm -hmm. because he knows that in the long term he's going to end up positive. That's a risk uh, uh, take up. The risk hours investor says that for maybe except for very short periods of time, I had no portfolio, I want to see a negative return. I don't mind settling for a client. Whereas the risk neutral investor says that I will be smart and I'll keep allocating that based on the advice of a financial advisor, I will switch to portfolios which will give me a minimize. So in a highly risk environment situation, he will go to risk neutral. In a highly growth positive investor, he will go towards positivity. So the risk neutral is the guy who will keep switching based on the environment out in the marketplace. Okay, some graphics that we have. Uh, so a risk taker investor would allocate, and please correct me if I'm yeah. wrong here, 70% of uh, his proportion into equity funds. Yeah. 25% into debt funds yeah. and 5% of that portfolio into gold. Correct. By gold, you mean gold funds or physical gold? Gold ETFs. Or? Gold ETFs. Gold ETFs. Yes. Okay. Mm. A risk neutral investor, I think the proportion changes to 60, 30 and 10. Correct. And I believe a risk averse investor would allocate 50% of his portfolio into equities. Yes. But a high proportion, 35% in debt and 15% in gold. Absolutely. Okay. Right. You, you, you find with these bifurcations? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Broadly. Now, before we get in Mr. Subramaniam's view on what average investors should do and how could they mit you know, mitigate the risks and go from one to the other, let me tell you about the merits or let Jayesh Khilani tell you about the merits or demerits, whichever way it turns out to be, of a risk neutral investor. Remember, he invests 60% in equity, 30% in debt and 10% in gold. Jayesh, uh, what's the average performance of an average mutual fund scheme been over a five year or 10 year period if he or she were a risk neutral investor? So Neeraj, uh, what we have done is uh, divided, uh, uh, you know, for example, 1 lakh rupees as the investment amount. Uh, now, if you look at that, uh, well, you know, based on the ratios that you were describing, 60, 30 and 10 percent, uh, equity equity would command a corpus of about 60,000, debt at 30,000 and gold at 10,000 rupees in that portfolio. Now, how these asset classes performed over time, and these are real life examples, if you can go to the next plate, uh, I'll show you the returns, or you know, that would have been generated. So equity has generated a CAGR in excess of 18%. Now, how I derive this 18% is, uh, you know, if you had invested in the top two and the bottom two, uh, you know, performing funds, mutual funds in the last 10 years, uh, the CAGR would be 18.4%. Gold at 8.6%. Uh, once again, this is the MCX gold example that we have taken. And debt, uh, we have assumed that 8% CAGR. At these growth rates, what would uh, you know your portfolio look like after 10 years? Let's have a look at that. Uh, the total amount that we are looking at for equity would have grown to 3.2 lakh rupees. So 60,000 has become 3.2 lakh, where the debt funds have generated 1.2 lakh, and gold, you know, just about 23,000 odd rupees. With the total portfolio would be about 4.7 lakh rupees on an investment of 1 lakh, uh, you know, in in the time period of 10 years. Which means that the return on investment that you would have generated over the 10 years, if we can go to that one, would be close to 17% CAGR for 10 years. Wow. 10%, 17% uh, compounded annual growth rate of return 
for a period of 10 years. That's nothing to scoff at. Jesh, thanks for putting that into perspective. So all those people who think that investing in a mutual fund portfolio, which has different facets and not just equity, will not give returns, are, are wrong. I mean, even if you diversify your portfolio, there is enough chance that you will get more than adequate returns. Absolutely. It's not just diversification. It's all the expertise that fund management, study of the market, study of stocks, projecting their cash flows comes in. So mm. that helps to minimize risk. Okay. So diversification is one thing which minimizes risk. That's pure mathematical diversification. But the expertise actually brings down risk far more because what the fund manager says switches the portfolio according to what. So you know, when you take risk, right? So you take inflation as a risk, right? Uncertainty of how much inflation. So the fund manager, what he does is in a high inflation scenario, pick stocks which benefit from inflation. So the, actually the higher return compensates for the risk. So the concept of return compensating for risk is a very, very uh, interesting one. Because normally people say risk means stay away. Right, don't cross that uh, when the traffic signal is right, don't go. No, the equity market risk is different. It's an intended risk as opposed to an unintended risk. So here actually by going into the boat, when the water is going high, go into the boat which is going to ride the crest, then go into the ride the trough. That's the smarter way to uh, beat risk and that's why I recommended a minimum of 50% in equities even for a risk averse investor. Hmm, risk averse. But okay, let's talk about a risk neutral investor. Let's yeah. assume so, that people are yeah. trying to talk about risk neutrality yeah. out yeah. here. Correct. I have a simple question. Uh, we have a lot of guests who come on air on the show mm. and spoken about investing into hybrid funds sure, or, or asset allocation funds, whichever way you call it. I, I think a lot of times people get confused within nomenclature, but by and large uh, funds, I believe wherein the fund manager will take a call of when to move out from a higher proportion of equities to a lower proportion of equities. Mm. My question to you is, for somebody who is a risk neutral investor mm. and he wants to allocate money in the fashion that we've said, which is whatever, 65, 25 and 10 percent mm. respectively, mm. Uh, should he or she allocate 65 percent of his mutual fund portfolio into pure equity funds, 25 percent into pure debt funds and 10 percent into gold ETFs? Or should he make use of instruments like a hybrid fund, uh, which, is, which is a better route to your mind? So uh, it's uh, actually the difference between laziness and actively managing a portfolio, right? So if you're lazy about managing the equity and debt component, you give it to a hybrid fund, right? You're like a balanced fund is generally 65% equity, 30% debt, which just fits with the uh, definition of the risk, risk neutral. neutral, right? So it's a bit of laziness. The problem there is that uh, within equities, there are large caps, mid caps, and small caps, yes. right? So the active allocation to those can enhance your returns and minimize your risk depending on, for example, when the economy is in a cyclical up cycle, right? Mid and small caps actually are better bets than large caps. Whereas the economy is in a slightly iffy down cycle situation, large caps are better. By giving it to a fund manager who manages for uh, hundreds of investors, right? He will take a very weighted average approach. But you want to know your risk appetite, right? Even within a risk neutral scenario and choose. So what I would say is if you want to actively manage, then within that 60% of equity for a risk neutral, the proportion you should put in large, mid and small is something with the help of an advisor wiser that you can manage to actually enhance return and minimize risk. Okay. So that aspect you will lose if you just go and give it to a, say, a balance fund or to an MIP which is 35% equity, 65% debt. So the actively if you want to manage with the help of an advisor because the advisor's job is to study this, I would say an actively managed hybrid portfolio of your own rather than passively giving it off to a fund manager and saying you manage and whether he chooses large cap or case based on his view is one. Second. When you give to a hybrid, right, you're taking that fund manager's view. Whereas suppose you're doing the active equity manager, you can split the large cap to three fund managers, split the mid cap to three, small cap to three. So you are getting diversification across fund management thought processes rather than depending on just one fund manager to do that. Because most balanced funds try to protect the investor. So mostly they have a highly large cap orientation in the equity. So I'm just saying is that the right way to manage risk is to actively manage risk and not to say passive and stay away. I've given my money, he will take care. Oh, got it. That's so if you, if I, I, I think, uh, sim simplified, if you have enough money to be able to put across various schemes, then you can probably do what Mr. Subramanian is saying, which is have uh, some money out of, let's say, 10,000 bucks that you have every month in an SIP, and then 1,000 each into each of these in that way. But if you don't have so much money, maybe the only option left is to uh, probably give to uh, a balanced fund or an asset allocation fund if you don't have 10,000 bucks and want to split it across. Say if somebody has only 
uh, say a college student has only a thousand or fifteen hundred uh, rupees possible in his SIP, then maybe that option is not available. Not necessarily. I think uh, equity mutual funds five hundred rupees is the minimum SIP amount. Right. Some schemes have only two fifty. Two fifty. So I would say the, the that person who's got only thousand five hundred, five years from now he'll have five thousand. 10 years from now, he'll have 20,000. So unless he learns with his 1,500 how to manage actively, when he reaches 10,000, how is he going to learn? How is he going to develop? How is he going to experience? How is he going to make mistakes, learn from those and adjust? So how small the amount, the mutual fund industry has got a small enough allocation to actively manage the portfolio. So just because it's a small, no excuse for laziness. Okay. Let him actively manage even that small one. Okay, I just have a two-part question, Mr. Subramaniam. I mean, would you... Uh, guys at Sundaram in your portfolios mm. have hybrid or balanced funds and, yeah, and, and you do. Mm. And would you still believe that uh, active management of funds via investment into an equity fund of Sundaram Mutual mm. and then diversifying into debt and gold funds be still a better route as opposed to uh, uh, a balanced fund or a hybrid fund or an asset allocation for an equity saving fund as the case may be? Uh, yes, on the balance, yes. The only exception I would make to when a person choose, choose hybrid or balance, I talked about laziness, so maybe that gave no. a slightly negative, but if you're the first time entrant into the equity market, uh -huh. right, then in that process of while you understand, right, a hybrid, because what happens is the hybrid, the equity debt will protect you if there's a fall. So your initial experience, like you're saying, you take a baby pool, you go and wet your feet before you enter the larger pool. So I would treat hybrids also as an entry level way for somebody who's been totally out of the, who's never touched equities. And now looking at the returns, looking at all the media, telling him equities are good, good, and you put up these 18% returns. Then as an entry level, to test out for, let's say, a year, to put in a balance, see how it performed, look at the portfolio, to do a study. So I would not rule it out as only, as I said, but once he learns a little bit, then I would say actively managing your thing is, is, is important. Second, in the balance fund category, today there's information available, right? You can still choose, provided you know clearly what that fund manager is doing. So let's say you have a balanced fund which has a higher allocation to mid-cap. And then you choose another one which has a higher large cap. Then you're actively choosing that balanced fund. But most people don't do that. But I'm saying that's another option because each fund house gives us uh, you know, breakup of mid and small caps. You can then choose it. You can say, look, uh, the issue is that with a balanced fund, the advantage, though of course the finance minister took away some part of the tax advantage, is that a balanced fund gives you a debt allocation at equity taxation. Whereas if I do a separate allocation on debt, I'm forced to stay for three years to get that taxation benefit, whereas an equity. But now with that 10% LTCG tax coming in, that difference has got narrowed down a little bit. But that's another aspect. So I'm just saying there are multiple aspects to take care uh, because earlier people used to take balanced funds because you're buying debt with equity taxation. Got it. So that, that's one more reason why balanced funds are huge flows. So that's begun to correct a little bit as recent data has shown. As recent data has shown. Yes, indeed. Um, what would... What would your preference be? Let's, I mean, I agree. The common advice, Mr. Subramanian, that we get from almost everybody is that if there is a first time investor who's coming in, he should start off with uh, funds which are likely to give, not give negative returns. Uh, and equity funds could give negative returns as well. So go in for balanced funds or hybrid funds, as you said, right, and then eventually develop. But let's say there are investors who are coming in with the mindset of investing for 10 years. Okay. And they, and let's say they are okay, even if they are first-time investors, to lose a little bit of money, a notional money, because their target is 10 years out. They have a goal. Let's say there is a, a, a student who's come out and gotten his first job at the age of 22, wants to get married at the age of 32, and doesn't mind investing that money and keeping it for 10 years. Is a first-time investor though. Would you still recommend? balance or hybrid funds or would you then say that because 10 year track records typically show that equity funds do well go out and invest in equity funds that depends on the risk uh, appetite no again if you're talking of a risk neutral guy for 10 years then 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 that, that's fine right in terms of putting it into equities but a risk covers guy for example though his outlook is 10 years he still doesn't have the capacity to bear intermediate losses so then for him a safer portfolio of higher allocation to debt is what I would recommend. He may have an outlook of 10 years, but he's saying that instead of having a dhoomdham shadi at a crore, I'll have a shadi at 50 lakhs, which is not so dhoomdham, right? Because he's risk averse, he's saying, let me not take the gamble of having one crore for doing a bigger shadi. But so his approach to what he needs at the end of 10 years is a function of his risk uh, appetite. So okay. I think that's where that keeps coming in. Without understanding your risk appetite, right, you cannot enter into this uh, business of investing. 
Okay. According to uh, you. One last question, though, sure. before I take in some questions that we sure. have, mm. uh, is the third aspect of a fund portfolio, which is gold mm. and gold ETFs. Mm. Now, uh, what would what, what would you recommend? I mean, the la recent history doesn't seem to be in favor of gold investments at all. Yet, in all of the three categories, you've given some weightage to gold. Why? And what should an average investor do with that? Okay. There are three aspects to gold, right? Hmm. Gold is a hedge against inflation. Gold is a hedge against war. Hmm. Gold is a hedge against volatility, hmm. right? So in the last few years, all these three have been low. Right. Inflation has been falling, threat of war has not been there, and who the Indian markets have not seen much volatility over the last three years. Ever since Modi came to power, hmm. there's been only a one right success. Though there have been corrections in the middle, the hmm. overall wall factor has been less volatility factor, right? But going forward, Right, you have now the protectionist uh, environment coming. You have the threat of war in Korea uh, coming in. You have the inflation, commodity prices internationally rising, which could have an impact over. So I think the volatility and the political uncertainties have led to the volatility. The reason I incorporate gold today, though it has not shown a very good return, is that I see the foreseeing days for the next 12 months till the our general election to be a highly volatile scenario and gold is your best hedge because you see the moment there is volatility gold prices showed up so why shouldn't an investor benefit that is what i mean by active management okay that when there is volatility gold is pricing you are getting a hedge against that volatility by rising gold price okay. so that's why you should have that fair call now a few questions mr subramaniam yeah um Aliyat girish kumar he's saying that i'm an mf investor since 2016 by the sip route mm. when i did a portfolio scan i found 30 percent of the exposure is in banking and financial names Correct. All mutual funds I am holding have got good track record for the last 5 to 10 years. Mm -hmm. But as banking is currently into trouble, do I need to switch my funds into agri or infra themes? Keep in mind, he's not a very old investor, only since 2016, so about two years. Two years. No, I would not uh, recommend him to switch out of the banking scenario for two, three reasons. One is that the benchmarks contain this proportion. Hmm. So every mutual fund will tend to carry that. Second is, just because of the current bad news, it doesn't mean banking is not a good buy for the next three years, because you're assuming that, that nothing's going to happen. Whereas, to me, the current negative news on the banking, while it's not a time for like going in and jumping and accumulating banking stock, ultimately the Indian economic growth cannot grow without growth in the banking sector. Hmm. So I believe in the next three to five years, banking as a sector will deliver very good returns, but there will be volatility. So if you want to enjoy those returns at the end of your three year time frame, especially since he's an SIP route investor, every correction means he's going to buy more units of those. So he's actually doing that, what is called as rupee cost averaging. So actually for an SIP investor, he should actually stay invested through this, not worry about the banking financial services exposure, because fund managers mm -hmm. will switch in out of good banks, bad banks, and those kind of things. So they are going to, that expertise aspect will come and help him out. Okay. Ashish Anand is asking about whether an SIP, which SIP is better? 1,000 rupees weekly or 4,000 rupees monthly? Uh, 1000 rupees weekly is better in the current context because of the volatility. So rather than pitch your one day in a month in which you put all your money, given the fact that the market has been, is going to go for the next 12 months at least to a high volatile states, I would say weekly HIPs should help him uh, buy more units at a lesser cost uh, over a period of a year. But so since it's impossible to time the markets, Mr. Subramaniam, would you believe that this would be a good strategy at any point of time? I mean, one would never know one year from now with the markets will have a continuous uptrend. So would a thousand weekly be a good strategy over 4,000 monthly if you're not into timing the market? Not really. See, I think that till the next general elections is where this volatility is going to be. After that, depending on how the situation pans out, right, whichever government comes to power in a majority, I think the economic forces are building in such a way that you're set for the next bull run post the general election. It's just the election uncertainty. So when you are in a clear-cut bull run kind of a situation, right, then the more often you buy, the point is you're missing out on that uh, gain. So I'm only recommending this weekly because the next one year I see volatility being high. But you know, less volatiles, like if you take the last three, four years, right, weekly SIP would not have done better than monthly SIPs, right? But this is just my read for the next 12 months. Okay. Uh, Ashish Anand, uh, again, is asked one more question is whether it's a good strategy to have similar mutual fund schemes from two different fund houses or three different fund houses. For example, if he has a portfolio containing a large cap, mid cap balance fund, would it be good or prudent to have it across mutual fund houses or the same fund house or is it irrelevant? 
I think uh, uh, the the uh, in the case of a large cap, I think it's irrelevant because you have the top 100. SEBI has now redefined large caps as top 100 stocks. So a fund manager has only a 20% ability to go beyond the top 100. So when you are playing in a small playground, right, between fund houses, there is not going to be much difference, right? Whereas in the mid cap, right, you have the index is 83 stocks. Your universe is 100 to 250, but you can take 20% from below 250 onwards or above 100. So the ability of different fund managers to have entirely different portfolios is very high. Mm. And small caps is even higher because there the portfolio is built bottom up rather than top down. So when you're bottom up, each fund manager and his associate and analyst are studying individual companies and betting on those companies based on their study, which could be very different from what the other fund manager is doing. So the smaller cap you go, the more you diversify across fund houses, the larger cap, one or two at the most, will help you get the alpha capture. And Ashish, I, I think goes without saying that it will be great if you can consult your mutual fund advisor if you're going into the mid cap or the small cap route as well about which fund will do well. Past performance may not necessarily be the best indicator of what a fund will do in the future. I hope I'm correct, Mr. Subraman, on this front. Uh, absolutely. Uh, I think that, but the only thing I would add there is that the advisor would actually help not just with past performance, the advisor would actually help him with the future True. fund manager's outlook. Because that's the job of an advisor. Exactly. Right. Okay. One last question. Um, I don't know how to answer this, but um, you're the expert. Uh, Vivek Nagpal is asking is there a structured way of actually measuring the risk profile of an investor? because uh, nothing that he has seen until now points towards that and without all of this mm. it is difficult or futile to really have conversations around what uh, what should the portfolio alignment be so i don't know what the nature of the question is but he's asking if there's a structured way of actually measuring the risk profile of an investor yeah, absolutely so i think if you go uh, to any uh, wealth based advisor mm -hmm. right they have this risk profile questionnaires there are about 100, 150 questions they ask you on how you react to different situations, based on which they assess your tolerance to risk, how much is your reward risk, uh, you know, ratio. So I think there are sophisticated tools available with the higher quality advisors. Bear in mind that higher quality advisors would want a fee from you to do that work. But if you're willing to invest in that, they can do a very good assessment of your uh, risk profile nature. Does asking oneself help, Mr. Subramaniam? I think that uh, I think it helps because that's why I said know yourself. So I think that if you see yourself in different situations, right, in your normal life, right, what kind of a person you are, and I said take it like crossing traffic signals. Are you a guy who always goes, waits for the signal, amber also you don't cross, wait for it to turn green, then go. So I think everybody understands. The point is that in financial terms, right, it's very, very uh, simple, right? Just think, everybody would have lost some money in his life sometime. What, just go back and recreate that situation to what your thought process. Did you panic when you had a loss? Or did you say, nah, yaar, it's okay, one bad decision, I will take it forward. So it's your personality type. And I think people who can objectively look at themselves can, can assess their risk profile. But I think the problem is that people enter markets from a thought process of greed and exit markets from a thought process of fear. It should right? be the other way around. So it should be the other way around. So that's what, uh, when I say that you should know that, right? So have you always come into the stock market, so only when there was a rise and everybody says, go, 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 sure. then clearly you're a risk averse guy because it's only that greed finally overcame the fear. Whereas you've been somebody who's steadily been there. So I think if people just objectively spend five minutes to right. think about themselves and the best solution, ask your wife. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody knows you better than your wife on what your risk taking capacity is. Yeah, or maybe your husband. Well, a lot of, yeah, lot of, right. Actually, lot of women yeah. <laughs> investors off late. A lot of questions that come in from women investors. No, no, no absolutely. No, no. When, I, when I said ask your wife, the, I know, I know. is this just, a, uh, completely. Uh, yeah. Ask your spouse, spouse, I think. That's, yes, that's what the right to say. Politically correct. Politically correct. Okay. Yeah, completely. <laughs> Mr. Subram, I'm so good having you. Thank you so much for these wonderful pieces of advice. And viewers, thanks for tuning in to the Mutual Fund Show. If you have further questions, do, do send them in. And we'll try and get the team from Sundar Mutual to reply to them over the course of the week. Thanks for tuning into this show.